Therapy isn't really as homogenous a field as you might think. We tend to think of therapy as containing lots of different um, approaches. But actually, therapy is divided into two halves, and the two halves don't go together. There's a split between them, a discontinuity. And we could say that there's two types of therapy. <clears throat> and we could say that there's the male type and the female type, which sounds a little bit odd, perhaps. Or maybe not, maybe it doesn't sound odd, because the, the feminine-masculine split is something that we come across in philosophy, something that we come across in Taoism particularly, the yin and the yang. So, there really is a split between yin type therapy and yang type therapy. Yang being the, the male type, the masculine type. So, just to explain this a bit better, we could say that men like, they have certain characteristics, they like um, asserting the law, laying down the law. Now I know this is, doesn't sound very fair to men, but I'm just talking about a particular characteristic, which if over exaggerated, does become um, fairly obvious and we can say, yes, I know that type of thing. So to take an extreme version of unbalanced masculinity, and we generally might not come across it, we probably won't come across it in most men that we meet, but we can recognize it all the same because it's kind of like, a, it's a familiar, almost a familiar caricature. And so talking about this caricature of what it means to be a man, you can say that one aspect of it is the dogmatic laying down the law aspect, saying what things are, this is how it is. And there is this satisfaction, undeniable, that comes from being the one who says how things are. It feels good, there's a kind of euphoria to that. It's a euphoric buzz. And euphoric buzz really is something that comes about when we're creating a structure, we make something, and it's like that feeling we get from making it, it's a good feeling. Or fixing something. When we fix something, we get a good feeling, it's like, yeah, that kind of feeling. Or when we put a shelf up and you know that shelf isn't going to go anywhere in a hurry, you say, yeah, that's, um, that's not going anywhere. So that's a type of an um, illustration of what I'm talking about. And another caricature of men is that men like engines and definite things. And the men will be very good at talking about their emotions, but they like to talk about things like a car engine and the bits in it and how it works. Now, I know that's a caricature, but it serves us in the sense that it helps to explain this particular um, way of looking at, at masculinity and say that it's about being definite and asserting. That's the principle, so that's the um, Yang principle, very clear cut. And another car caricature is to say that when you tell a man your problems, they just think, ah, fix it as if it's the fixing that's the important thing. And that's a cliche, but it's also, there's truth in it as well. So we could say that <clears throat> by the same token, that when it's the feminine principle we're talking about, and we might tell our troubles to a woman instead of a man. And so they're not going to be jumping in trying to fix it the whole time. What they'll do is they'll listen. And listen is, listening is a thing that we want, really. We don't want someone to annihilate or try to annihilate our 
suffering by jumping in with fixes <clears throat> because that's just um, avoidance really it's avoiding the emotional pain that's there and it's also dismissing the emotional pain that's there although fixing is a great thing in the right circumstances if your car's broken it's late at night it's raining and cold and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and someone works out what's wrong with the car and fixes it for you that's a great thing but therapy wise not so great so what we can say about the two types of therapy the masculine type and the feminine type is that the male type therapy what we do is we identify problems and attempt to fix it by action by doing something and another part of male type therapy that pole of therapy is to say that um, it's based on a theory or a model of what's going on so if i was to step into the role of a yang type therapist i have a theory of you and i'm looking at you and i'm projecting that theory not necessarily of you as a person but a theory of things in general and you fit into that theory I'm projecting that onto you so you can see that the yang type <clears throat> involves me projecting a framework or an idea of things and then operating within that framework and when I listen to you it's not open-ended listening because I'm listening to you from that framework from that theory which is a very narrow type of listening and if what your problem is happen to, happens to have great congruence with my theory then it could be useful but in mental health when we when we are having a hard time there isn't really that much congruence with any theory that someone might have in, in psychotherapy in psychiatry we could say there are certain examples where there is a congruence that's very noticeable so if someone is extremely elated you can say yes that's congruent with my theory that there is a thing called bipolar affective disorder so you can see there that um, the masculine or yang type approach works to a certain extent in a certain way in a pragmatic way it's a system of it's a taxonomic system, a system of classifications which has some correspondence in some cases, and a lot of cases, maybe a fair amount of cases. And because there is a correspondence, that could be a useful thing. It kind of is a useful thing. But then we've got to remember that there's lots of subtleties and nuances, and a lot of things don't fall into a more clear cut psychiatric diag diagnostic cate category. So, and and then we're blindsided because we don't know what to do because projecting our ideas on someone doesn't help them because there is no correspondence between the theory and what's actually happening so when we have a model or a theory that can very easily turn into full blindness because we're blind that's sometimes called model blindness we're blind to anything that doesn't correspond to our model we're not blind to things that do correspond to our model but then inevitably there are going to be areas which don't correspond so there's a lot of blindness there one way or another another aspect of male type therapy is that it involves doing as i said <clears throat> and that leads on to um this the, the, the idea that is doing and also i tell you what to do so here's your situation and me and my role is expert tell you what to do when you do this or you want to do that or maybe not micromanaging what you do but giving you a framework of things to do so that's male type as well if you are the patient and I am the yang type therapist I have authority that comes out of my knowing my knowledge my maps and my skills and my experience so there's that particular um, 
relationship going on. Now, when we come to talking about the feminine type psychotherapy, it's harder to talk about it. A little bit harder anyway. So what we could say is that female or feminine type psychotherapy basically involves what is called in the trade holding a space, which can sound a bit confusing because you'd wonder how you could hold a space. It's nothing to grab hold of. It's too space, too spacey. <clears throat> but what it means is that a kind of psychological space is maintained. <clears throat> and it's kind of like a space within whatever wants to come out or emerge can come out and there's going to be no judgment. It's all equally allowed to come out and there's no nothing to be fixed, no right, no wrong. But we're going to hold a space there for material to come out. Material meaning psychic material, psychological material, whatever comes out when you're talking or if it's art therapy, doing art. Obviously, this is much more pertinent to the creative and type of therapy, such as art therapy. In art therapy, with the exception of some types, but generally speaking, <clears throat> we don't project our own ideas and try and see how if <clears throat> the, our client kicks into those <clears throat> ideas. Because that's positive. That's saying what things are. It's laying down the law. It's um, that particular type of masculine authority, which can be good in a way in the sense that it can give us a sense of security, big father figure type of security. But it isn't really good because <clears throat> it's denying or dismissing what's there, <clears throat> which doesn't, isn't actually going to fit with the um, framework or model because... Each one of us in our heart of hearts, in the very core of us, what's there doesn't fit in to any framework or model. That's what it means to be a human. It means you don't fit into any framework. That's what makes us so awkward. So <clears throat> when it's actually humans you're dealing with, it generally tends to be, we could say that the feminine approach is better because we are holding a space there for anything. And that's good because no matter who you are and no matter what your experiences or the nuances of um, your situation, history, there's a space for it. It doesn't matter across the board, there's a space for it. And no one's trying to make sense of it or analyze it or jump ahead and try and fix it or anything like that. And that creates a, <clears throat> that creates a situation where, because we're not being judged, and I don't necessarily mean judged in a moral, ethical kind of way, but evaluated in any type of framework type way, <clears throat> that gives us permission to be free. Being evaluated or judges, judged never gives us permission to be free. free. The male type therapist never gives us permission to be free. That doesn't mean like a male therapist can't ever give you permission, because a male therapist isn't a caricature of the extreme masculinity. A male therapist also has female, just as a female therapist also has male. <clears throat> but we're just talking about the extremes in order to explain um, more clearly what, what male type and female type therapy is. So female type therapy is allowing and it's not coming out of the the ruler of the, of the rational mind, which is measuring everything in a black and white way. There's no need to measure. Why would you need to measure? Because you haven't got any theories to, if you're measuring it, you just want to see what it is so you can relate it to your categories. It's a, that kind of a thing. When you're just witnessing what's there, there's no need for a ruler, no need for a yardstick, no need for anything like that. You're just witnessing what's there. And the therapeutic thing that comes out of that is, as I have said, when there's freedom for anything to come out, then maybe not straight away, but stuff will come out. And it's the very fact that it comes out and whatever does come out in the session can be witnessed 
in a non-judgmental way. And that has an immensely freeing <coughs> effect because what helps is the and the benign witnessing, as um, one uh, psychotherapist once said to me, who I was saying at the time, so it's the benign witnessing. That is the key to everything, not fixing and not cleverness or some kind of procedure. And the extreme or caricature male type therapist <clears throat> can't be a benign witness because they're coming out of a framework. There's no benignness there. Frameworks are actually always inimical to human beings, just as bureaucracy is. They can be practically necessary or even essential under certain circumstances, but we mustn't lose sight that frameworks are always inimical, or inimical, inimical. I always get into problems with that word. To human beings, because human beings in our core we are not regular, we're not part of, we're not something that can be accommodated within a generic system or a standardized system. And that's what it means to be a human being. And so we mustn't lose sight of um, what we're dealing with as human beings. So we have to be careful when we're too keen to throw frameworks onto everything and project frameworks and theories and models and all of that kind of stuff. And we love theories and models. <clears throat> we, we really do. So it's, it's kind of as if we don't feel that we know what we're doing unless we have loads of models and theories written down to prove that we're coming from a scientific, in inverted commas, place. But all that is is really a security for the, for the professional, really. It shows lack of confidence. Well, maybe not lack of confidence, lack of trust in the natural process or fear of being vulnerable. And yet we're asking our clients to be vulnerable. And we can't do that if we're not being vulnerable too. That's just, it's not on really. Look, here's the deal. You be really vulnerable and I'll be completely um, um, non-vulnerable, armoured, <clears throat> in my in my therapist role with never a little sign of who's behind, who's playing the role, who's the vulnerable one, because when we get beneath the role, everyone is vulnerable. So we have to be vulnerable. And there's no way I can be vulnerable as a therapist if I'm coming from a model or a theory. It's impossible because that model or a theory or approach is, <clears throat> it's my way of being invulnerable. It's my way of protecting myself. So even though it might be said, hey, what type of a therapist are you? You going in there without any fancy theories and research and all the, that kind of claptrap. You're, you're some kind of joker, you're not for real, you're not proper, you're not serious. But the fact is, the only type of therapist that is genuine, and not just acting the part, but afraid to actually <clears throat> get in there, is a therapist with no models, no theories, no um, things that they do. Oh, you said that, therefore I'll say this. None of that kind of rubbish at all. So it's a very, very vulnerable position because we don't know, we have no expertise. We have no um, positive knowledge. We have no qualifications and certificates and stuff because you can't be, you can't be certified or certificated to be vulnerable. That this guy has passed his vulnerability exams. Yes, he can be a therapist because now he's vulnerable. Vulnerable has no means of support. But the great thing about vulnerable is it's not a weak position. It's the strongest position there is. And if I, as a therapist, am vulnerable with 
my client, that gives them permission to be vulnerable too. And that isn't a weak place to be in. It's when we're hanging on to something, desperately trying to be something or someone, that is the weak place. Which is counterintuitive in the sense that when we see, um, going back to the, the caricature male, they know how to fix it. Plus, they know what it is. They know what reality is. It's like this, kids. And you can think of a grand patriarch with a, a beard and he's kind of like um, head of some re great religion, a male type, Father God religion, needless to say. And he's kind of um, the, the embodiment of that. And I'm not going to name any particular religions, but you, you know the type of thing I mean. He's kind of like um, banging on the pulpit or banging on the whatever it is laying down the law saying how it is which is pure violence and pure lack of vulnerability obviously so even though that that, that character caricaturical male masculine seems to be strong in the sense they have they know they have the knowledge they have they know what to do they have the right action and they're very, very sure of themselves because they have a black and white picture of reality, even though that comes across as strong. And when you see a man in that modality with a big beard and um, banging on the table and laying down the law, it feels strong. It can do if you, if you don't see through it. If you do see through it, you realize that it's completely, completely weak. It's a person who's denying their weakness and hiding from their weakness. And the reason they're denying their weakness and hiding from their weakness is because they're too weak to own up to it. So they're too weak to um too too weak to acknowledge their weakness and be their weakness. So they come across as being strong and dogmatic and controlling instead. And in all um, relationships. We can see that just to take that um, again stereotypical view of a controlling man who's controlling his partner. So if his partner is a woman, we'll say, and he's a controlling man, he seems he say he's laying down the down the law the whole time, saying how things are or how they should be, and not giving life a chance to happen. And that's because he's weak and he's afraid of his weakness, which when you see it is, is very, very clear. And where the strength really lies is coming into the fray without this authority, the male type authority. And without knowing what to do, and without having things that I can tell you, or oh, you should do this, you should do that. That is, um, the position of supreme vulnerability and it's the only helpful position it's the only position that has actual genuine strength in it okay thanks for watching